Welcome to Real Estate is Taxing, where we talk about all things real estate tax and break down complex concepts into understandable, entertaining tax topics. My name is Natalie Kalati. I'm your host, and I am so excited that you've decided to join me. A $3 million New York City condo furnished with $300,000 of high-end furnishings, a $100,000 SUV, and an extramarital affair. Are we talking about a Lifetime movie? It could be, but it's not. We are talking about a very recent tax court case, TC Memo 2024-76, about Gregory and Laura Schnackel. Gregory and Laura had been married since 1985, and in 2000, Gregory started an S-Corp. He was the sole owner of this business, SEI, and he mostly provided engineering and design services related to real estate and construction projects. He consulted and designed various systems, including plumbing, electrical, sprinkler systems, and the overwhelming majority of his work was in commercial real estate. Over 75% was commercial. Now, they were based in Omaha, Nebraska, and at that time, they did have offices in California and in New York City. The wife in this case, Laura, had very little involvement with Gregory's business. She had a degree in human nutrition and service management, and she worked as a nutritionist prior to helping out with the business, but only in a very minimal capacity. She took an intro to accounting class and did very limited amounts of bookkeeping for SEI. Mostly she was just signing checks and looking at receivables and payables. In addition to Laura handling this limited amount of accounting for SEI, they did have an outside accountant as well as an in-house accountant who worked exclusively for Greg's S-Corp. So the wife's involvement was pretty minimal when it came to the business. Even past that, the years we are going to be talking about, Laura wasn't even doing accounting for those years. She was working as a wellness coordinator for the business. In the early 2000s, Greg decides he wants to get further into the New York market. Around 2004, he starts taking multiple trips there and is trying to build out a network and a customer base in New York City. In these early years, Gregory starts off by sharing office space with an architecture firm that is also based in New York so that he has somewhere to operate out of when he is in the city and working on building this clientele. During 2005, however, that architecture firm decides they do not want to continue sharing space, and now Gregory needs to find a new New York location to operate SEI out of when he is there on his trips. For a couple years, he's transient. There is no new office space. And whenever Gregory visits New York City, he was based out of hotels and was spending a fair amount of time there, even with this being the case. So for 2005 and 2006, SEI only had a couple small projects that were in New York, but Gregory was spending at least a third of his time there. In December of 2006, Gregory decides that it is time to buy a property in New York City so that he has somewhere to operate out of while he's there building this client base and impressing New York real estate moguls. Obviously, this can't be your run-of-the-mill office. Gregory needs something that shows he is also a savant in real estate and to be trusted. He goes out, and in 2006, he purchases a penthouse in New York for $3.25 million. Only Gregory is listed as the owner of this condo. Laura did come and tour it with him once before purchase, but she really has nothing to do with it. It is literally a condo that is there for Greg's travel to New York and where he can bring investors and potential clients when he is staying in New York and building that client base. This condo was almost 3,000 square feet and had an outdoor terrace with views of Manhattan 
incredibly high-end building. Whether or not this met the criteria of being ordinary and necessary is still to be determined. Now, when Gregory purchased this condo, he did so with a primary occupancy loan. He attested to the fact that he would not be renting out this property and it was going to be used as his second home. That was the terms of his loan. However, the very beginning of 2007, so just a few weeks after purchasing this condo, Gregory signs a lease agreement between SEI, his S corporation, and himself for the company to rent his personal condo from him. Now, this is something that is allowed. If someone wants to rent real estate they own to a company that they are operating out of that real estate, this can absolutely be a valid transaction. The amount of rent, the expenses, the way the contract is structured needs to be from a standpoint of what would be reasonable and ordinary if they were renting any other space. However, that's not how Gregory went about this. He did not advise, nor did his wife advise, with any kind of a real estate expert to determine what fair market rent would be for this condo, to establish what a reasonable amount would be for SEI to pay him personally for the use of this condo in his personal name. Instead, for multiple years, SEI signs a lease with Gregory to pay him $28,000 per month for use of his personally owned condo. This amount was literally just calculated as the amount it would take to cover Gregory's cost of owning the condo. So there was no consideration or no analysis of what a reasonable rent amount would be. Gregory was just moving money from his business to himself personally, labeled as rent, so that he was not out of pocket any amount personally for his ownership of this condo. Now, in retrospect, this $28,000 a month was overstated and was an abnormally high amount for rent for any of the years in question. At the onset of the petitioner looking at their tax returns, they went through and established fair market rents for the years in question. And for 2011, fair market rent would have been $22,500, would have been $21,500 for 2012, $23,000 for 2013, and $25,000 for 2014. So Gregory was paying several thousand dollars above fair market value rent for this condo every single month during all of these years. But more importantly, he was paying based on an amount to literally shift what would be personal costs to business, not from a reasonable basis of what fair market rents would be for the use of his condo. After Greg buys this condo, he obviously has to furnish it and update it in a way to match the quality of the high-end condo, the quality of the type of clients he's trying to gain in New York. So he then spends, over the next several years, $326,000 furnishing and updating this condo. After paying for all of these things, he depreciates them as business use assets because they're in this business use condo. All of these furnishings and updates are listed on the books for SEI. And these included things such as a baby grand piano, various artwork that is not just wall art, and luxury sheets, linens, rugs, etc. So very much pushing the level of what would be acceptable for ordinary and necessary furnishings for a condo that is intended to be used for only business use. It's also important to note that at no point during these years was the condo only used for business purposes. I think that's pretty clear when we determined that Gregory only had a couple of small projects in New York, but was spending a third of his time there. So in addition to all of that extra time Gregory was just spending in New York City in his new 
high-end, luxuriously furnished condo. They also spent Thanksgiving weekend there with the whole family every year. Why wouldn't you? Thanksgiving in New York is stunning, but that's not business use. There was also a time during 2013 when their daughter lived in the condo full-time and was using both the property, the furnishings, everything that was put in there as business use because she was attending NYU during 2013. During all of these years in question from 2011 on, neither the taxpayer nor their accountant was keeping track of these business use versus personal use days. They just weren't reporting any kind of a split. They weren't allocating between the two uses as required. They were just reporting the $28,000 rent expense for business use of this condo. The flip side to this is if a business is renting your real estate from you personally, you then need to report the rents from this business use. You are receiving rental income. This is because with the Augusta rule, you have 14 days or less where you do not have to report any income or expenses. But once you are above that 14-day mark, it is all reportable. And now the taxpayer would need to be reporting the income from rents received from his business to also be able to claim the expense for rents paid by the business. There's no mention if that was done, but that's not what the court is looking at here. So during none of those years, was that difference of business and personal use tracked, let alone was it reported? In addition to having the luxury condo with the luxury furnishings to get the high-end clientele, obviously Gregory needs to arrive to client meetings in style. At the very end of 2011, Gregory goes out and purchases a brand new 2012 Range Rover for just shy of $100,000. Unlike the business and personal use of the condo, which had not been tracked at all, the taxpayer did put together a log of his business and personal miles for the Range Rover and said that he did this during 2012. This was said to have been done to help facilitate the preparation of the 2011 taxes to be able to show his amount of business mileage. However, Gregory also noted that the information that he put onto this log was based on his memory and when he knew he was in New York and dates and things like that. This wasn't an ongoing log kept day to day as the vehicle was driven. But it's better than nothing, Gregory did have a log. However, in spite of Gregory's testimony saying that this log was created during 2012 to help with the preparation of the 2011 taxes, Gregory's accountant said they did not have any mileage log for their 2011 tax return. SEI actually didn't report any use of the vehicle on its 2011 tax return. Instead, what it reported was just special depreciation in the amount of 94334 the purchase price of the Range Rover. So there was no correct reporting of the vehicle and its business usage on the S-Corp return. All there was the reporting of depreciation on an asset, but no actual vehicle reporting. Past all of this drama, we've now gotten to the point where Gregory has the condo, it's nicely furnished, the daughter's used it some years, the family's used it some years. There's no reporting the differences there. Gregory buys the high-end SUV. We write off the entire SUV. Even though there's no proof or substantiation reported, then we get to 2010. In 2010, Gregory meets someone while he's in New York. He began meeting with this person regularly from 2010 through 2013. And during this time, to the taxpayer's favor tax-wise, he was not actually using that New York condo for personal use. This is because he didn't want his wife to find out about his mistress in New York. So there was a large portion of time here from 2010 through 2013 where Gregory actually wasn't using the condo for personal use much at all. Instead, 
he was using hotels because he didn't want the connection between his new mistress and the condo. In addition to that, when the courts were reviewing the financials for SEI, it found that between 2013 and 2017, the taxpayer had made just shy of $3 million in payments to a secret credit card, in addition to taking out over a half million dollars in cash that directly went to the affair partner, to his mistress, and to funding all of the fun activities of their affair. So a whole lot of questionable things, both tax-wise and morally, but something we've seen more than once in tax court, if the person testifying has proven to not be credible or that they're breaking either laws or that they're known to fabricate truths or things like this historically, the tax court has a hard time relying on their testimony related to this matter. If they would lie to their employer, partner, etc., why wouldn't they lie regarding their taxes? Because of this extramarital affair, a unique situation came up additionally in relation to this case, which was Laura, the wife, applying for innocent spouse relief on the amounts owed, the penalties, etc., based on being kept in the dark. Obviously, if Gregory was operating in a way to hide a multi million dollar affair, there was no reason for the IRS or the courts to believe that Laura was in the know on all of the incorrect use of this piece of New York real estate, of all of the inappropriate business expenses claimed, etc. As we learned early on, she had very little involvement in the business, which was only in Gregory's name, so very little reason to believe Laura was in the know. Combined with this affair that he was hiding from her, there was an application there for innocent spouse relief. At the end of all of this, you guys might be wondering, well, across these years, how much did they end up owing when the IRS came back and opened up their returns for 2012 through 2014? What were the amounts that it was determined that Gregory and Laura owed? And what kind of penalties did they have? It was a pretty substantial amount. For 2012, 13, and 14, it was determined that they had deficiencies of $244,965, $100,550, and $98,002. Additionally, they incurred an accuracy-related penalty under Section 6662, which has to do with intentionally disregarding and reporting something knowingly incorrect. For 2012, this penalty amount was $44,993. It was just over $20,000 for 2013 and just under $20,000 for 2014. With all of these considerations, Gregory really did almost everything in the worst way possible when it came to these large very questionable write-offs. He rented this condo that was a three-plus million dollar condo with over $300,000 of furnishings in it to his company based only on the amount it would take to cover the expense of ownership, no actual analysis of fair market rent. In addition to that, there seems to be no substantial proof that the use of the condo related to the business much at all. While Gregory was trying to establish a New York clientele and build the business there, there was only ever a few small projects, nothing that would justify the spending of millions of dollars to establish further business activity in New York. The juice wasn't worth the squeeze here. However, there was a pretty driving personal motive for having this condo. In those earlier years, we had personal use for the family at vacation. We had some summertime vacation use, use for it every Thanksgiving. The daughter even lived in the condo for a while. So when looking at this side-by-side -side of if this piece of property had more of a personal benefit or a business benefit, it very heavily leans to the personal side. 
Additionally, after 2010, Gregory had a pretty large personal benefit to spending additional time in New York, which was the start of this ongoing affair that we know went on through at least 2017 based on the records from this case. So obviously, if Gregory has a mistress in New York, he has a very personal motive for spending more time in New York. Even though during those years, he didn't use the condo as much because he didn't want his wife to see the mistress at the property, there was still excessive trips to New York and time spent there and literally millions of dollars spent as a result of it. Now, Laura, the wife who did apply for innocent spouse, Gregory tried to argue that she absolutely knew about the business use or lack thereof related to the condo and the Range Rover and everything else. However, the courts looked at all of this and said Laura had no ownership in the business. She had a tiny sliver of participation in the business. She only received a very small benefit from the New York condo. Her personal advantage was pretty minimal. And even though it was stated that Laura did have a large interest, a large control in the finances of their household, there was no link between her having that same amount of involvement or to show any kind of similar level of control in the finances of SEI, of Gregory's company. All of that combined with the fact that multiple years that were brought up under audit were when Gregory was having an extramarital affair, led the courts to land on the fact that obviously he was hiding things from Laura. If Laura had a good understanding of everything that was going on in New York in relation to this condo, what the business activity there really was, the Range Rover, all of the time Gregory spent there, if she had a clue to it being much less business use than it was, then there's also a good chance she would have discovered this affair. She had no reason to think Gregory was not in New York for business purposes, and that's what she believed, and the tax court agreed with her. So ultimately, she was issued innocent spouse relief when it came to this case. Like I said, this case could be made into a Lifetime movie. I can picture it in my head. I can see the whole thing play out. In my head, I have a picture of the mistress, and she's one of those New York women who wears those sheer robes with fluffy fur around the arms and the very bottom and wears, like, high-heeled house slippers. But that's probably not the case, but that's who I would cast if this were made into a Lifetime movie. In the end, if a court case reads like a movie, I think the key takeaways should be that these extravagant, these high-end, these really pushing what's allowable write-offs should be questioned. Every time you see an influencer online who is telling you you can convert most of your day-to-day -day costs, you can convert your luxurious personal life into a write-off, question it because this is the outcome. Gregory and his S-Corp is the exact example of someone who is trying to abuse what is allowable within the tax code for business write-offs and had it all unravel and had his life unravel as part of it. So the next time you see an influencer saying that they are writing off their cost to stay in a $12,000 a night hotel as ordinary and necessary, just know that if they're under audit, there's going to be a really uphill battle to prove why that was needed. There's always a scale of what is reasonable, and if the cost of something is standard for the industry, if it results in an increase in revenue and can you prove that, and most importantly, making sure you are substantiating all of these expenses for what they are. Had Gregory kept good, accurate logs during those years of business use in the condo versus personal use, some of that expense may have still been allowed. As we learned, there were several years where a lot of his personal use in New York was spent staying at hotels instead because of the affair. 
If that was the case, then there's a good argument that during those years, he might have had only business use for that condo with less than 14 days of personal use. But Gregory didn't even make an attempt to track all of this. And from the start, he just claimed all of the cost as business costs. A step farther, Gregory's accountant, Gregory tried to throw under the bus. They tried to say, well, my tax preparer filed this every year. They knew I didn't have logs. They let me do it anyway, et cetera, et cetera. Gregory's tax professional came back and said, yep, we did know. And there are multiple communications and lots of proof that we told him that he needed to maintain logs, that if this was ever looked at, it would be disallowed, that he was informed of the requirements and what he should be doing to justify these write-offs and the taxpayer failed to comply. So shifting the blame to the fact that you used a tax professional also doesn't work and has been disallowed in many cases because ultimately as a taxpayer, you are responsible for your return. And especially if you've been told what you need to be doing and you are just choosing to not keep those records to follow those steps, then it's absolutely on you. This was an incredibly interesting case Again, if you want to dive into this yourself, this is Tax Court Memo 2024-76, and this is Gregory and Laura Schnackel, v. Commissioner, and that last name is S-C-H-N-A-C-K-E-L. I'm not sure if I'm saying that correctly, but I did take my best try at it as a personal holder of a hard-to-pronounce last name. I do make a best attempt when it comes to unique name. And I will end today's episode with just a final note that I think a lot of people are wondering, which is the fact that throughout this case, I referred to Gregory and his wife. However, as of 2017, Laura did file for divorce and they are no longer married. So once this was all unraveled, she did peace out of there. I don't know the outcome. I just hope she got the condo. Seems fair. But I guess we'll never know. We'll have to write our own ending for the Lifetime movie. So as always, I hope you guys found this episode interesting. Hope you found a little bit of insight in this court case about a very popular topic. And if you think someone else would enjoy this, please share this episode with them. Please subscribe, share, and like. And as always, I will talk to you guys next week.